My name is Rebecca Campbell. I work with Elizabeth Sackler at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. Um, and we are here to present additional support to the already fantastic uh, Sackler Center staff. And I'm thrilled um, that all of you are here today to be here for this panel discussion, Passioning Persona, ge uh, Collage, Gender, and Feminism. I'm going to be quite brief since we have a lot of people today, but and I just want to say a couple things. For the past six years, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art has continued to fulfill its commitment to the past, present, and future of feminist art, using its award-winning exhibition space and education spaces. The Sackler Center strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions. Dialogue and debate about feminist art, theory, and activism take place here in the Sackler Center Forum, and groundbreaking exhibitions are held in its feminist art and her story galleries. Um, currently in the galleries is Wangechi Mutu, A Fantastic Journey, and it really is an apt title. It's really fantastic. Um, it's powerful and beautiful, and I hope uh, every one of you, if you haven't seen it already, has a chance to view it afterwards. Um, and given Wangechi's use of collage in her work, I'm particularly pleased the show is up for today's conversation. Uh, Elizabeth Sackler could not be here today, unfortunately, but she asked me to express how delighted she is that the uh, International Collage Center has put together this important conversation and that you were able to, to use this forum space so, so well. Um, before we begin, uh, there are many thank yous that I just want to mention quickly. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with the International Collage Center. Um, and I'd like to thank Pavel Zubok, the founder and its artistic director, and Rachel Law, the director. Um, thank you also to the amazing artists on our panel today that have come here to speak. Genesis Breyer Piorich, Colette, and Kate Hardy, and of course, today's moderator, scholar Judith Rodenbeck. Um, and of course, again, a big thank you to you, Jess Wilcox um, at the Sackler Center for coordinating and corralling us all. Um, so that's all from me, and now I'd like to welcome Rachel Long up to the front. Hi, along with ICC founder Pavel Zivok, I'd like to welcome you here today. The ICC is a non-profit dedicated to exploring the art and culture of collage, producing exhibitions, programs, and events, alongside developing a lending and research collection and archive dedicated to collage. We're delighted to present this panel as part of our constructive conversation series, lectures and panels on collage and related topics in partnership with other cultural institutions. We're thrilled to have the inaugural event with the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Arts I would like to thank Dr. Elizabeth Sackler, Rebecca Taffel, and Jess Wilcox for their enthusiastic support in developing and hosting this event. The panel was developed to celebrate Collage's powerful feminist history and its continued use as a tool by contemporary artists who use collage strategies for creative self-fashioning and artists' use of the constructed form of this collage to question the fixity, not just of the image, but of identity. We're honored to have three incredible and trailblazing artists with us today to discuss this topic, Colette, Genesis Breyer Priorich, and Kate Hardy. We're also delighted to have art historian and critic Judith Rodenbeck as moderator. Judith was crucial in developing the panel um, as art historian, critic, and scholar at Sarah Lawrence College. She has special interests in technology and feminist theory and the author of Radical Prototypes, Alan Caporal, and the Invention of Happenings, and co-author of Experiments in the Everyday, Alan Caporal and Robert Watts, Events, Objects and Documents. She's a contributor to catalogues for the Guggenheim Museum, the American Society, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and serial publications such as Art Forum, Grey Room and October, amongst others. She is editor-in-chief of the Art Journal from 2006 to 2009, and recipient of the 2009 Creative Capital Warhol <coughs> Foundation Arts Writers Grant. So, I'd like to hand you over to Judas now, who will introduce the rest of our panellists. And um, again, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Hi. Uh, first, I'd like to start also with thanks to the Sackler Center, uh, especially to Jess Wilcox and to Catherine Morris, 
um, for helping us pull this together. Obviously to the International Center for Collage, um, Pavel Zubak and Rachel Law, and especially to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation for making the event possible. Uh, and thank you, Rebecca, <coughs> for that introduction. Um, so the way things are going to proceed is uh, uh, the following. I'm going to be relatively casual about this, and I will try to get out of the way, because these three people are far more interesting than <laughs> I am. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is give a, a very brief kind of framing set of remarks about collage. Um, and then some very short uh, introductions, um, sketches really, of each of these artists. And then um, Genesis, Colette, and Kate will each present for about 15 minutes of, uh, an overview of um, aspects of their projects, let's say. Fair. Um, including, I think we have a couple of video clips, and hopefully they will work. So cross, cross your fingers. Uh, and then I may ask a few framing questions for a conversation, but, but basically this is for you three to have a chance to talk to one another and to talk to the audience. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll, uh, I'll start um, by noting that uh, collage has been called by uh, some critics the single most revolutionary formal inter innovation in artistic representation uh, in the 20th century. And I want to just suggest some of the ways in which um, we might think about it. Um, collage is disruptive. It is formally disruptive of the clean and unified surface. It's materially disruptive of that unified surface. In as much as it is disruptive, um, it is also a disruption of hierarchy. Uh, and as I'm sort of tossing out these ideas, one might also think in what uh, senses and respects are these notions, these formal properties, and then eventually these political properties connected to what we might call a feminist project. Collage relies upon a shock effect, that is, the disruption of that unified surface produces a shock effect in, in uh, certain critics' writings. That shock effect has been um, discussed as uh, the effect of a, a kind of bullet through culture. Right? So we want to think about that too. Collage produces a narrative uh, interruption in the steady flow of uh, traditional representational schemes. Now these are formal, uh, formal aspects of collage, but I'll put it to you that these all have um, political resonance. In fact, they are political um, gestures. That is, collage disrupts the seamless flow of a straightforward ideology, however you take that ideology uh, to frame itself. Um, collage is the bringing of the outside into the inside, the inside into the outside, um, the undomesticating of the domestic, uh, uh, perhaps the redomesticating of the undomesticated. I want to lay out a very short, um, uh, radically schematic, um, embarrassingly schematic uh, sequence of uh, 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 precedents or at least cognates that can help one think about um, how these principles operate from the early Dada work of uh, Hannah Hoke through some of the work visible in the galleries next door by Wangechi Mutu that make use of these disruptive techniques. Uh, th these uh, each have certain kinds of strategies to the um, uh, public interventions of an artist like Martha Rosler. Those all exist on the relatively flat plane when we're thinking about collage as a, a, an essentially wall-based object, or in the case of Rosler, uh, a print um, distributed object. In terms of performance, collage in the West has a history that at least goes back to something like Four Saints and Three Acts by Gertrude Stein, a, a collage text that allows for that um, performance to uh, uh, traduce history in a sense, to produce a, a kind of long expanse and a very particular kind of community. It's a, a, a play that revolves around the recuperation uh, of the figure of Susan B. Anthony, uh, 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 casting her as a kind of saint. To the collage techniques of a performance group like, for example, the Worcester group, more closely related to theater. Finally, I want to think about collage in relation to the very notion of constructing a self, which is part of what our panel is 
uh, addressing today. And in particular, what comes to mind for me is the uh, Dada artist Tristan Zara's instructions for making a self-portrait. That is, to make a self-portrait, says Tristan Zara, uh, you take a piece of newspaper, um, cut it up, shake, shake those little parts, and pull them out at random, and the result uh, the resulting poem is a portrait of you. Collage demands anti, uh, an anti-patriarchy uh, uh, as a kind of form, that is, it's a kind of anti-form. It demands a kind of radical theatricality. Uh, it disrupts the regulatory guise of the quotidian for something new in that shock effect. In so doing, uh, radicalized collage allows not only for found imagery, but for found behaviors. And in that finding of behaviors, the indication of the restrictive qualities of those behaviors. Collage has a deliberate liminality. Right? It's a transition uh, mode from one place to another place. So I want to think uh, in the context of this panel, and I hope we will get there about issues that have to do with things like um, individual versus collective practices, collaborative <coughs> practices, um, what it is to build a community or communities, uh, what those might be, what it is to disrupt a community, um, how we understand identity. Um, we might toss out the word authenticity, but we might just say that now and not deal with it um, further down the road. We'll just let it uh, sit and fester a little bit. Uh, identities and or personae, how personae operate in the world. What is the sightedness of collage as a performed practice and as a lived practice? Um, uh, what is collage's relation to the nomadic? <laughs> yeah. um, Okay. Uh, and finally, um, the relation, particularly in the context of the practice of these three artists, uh, uh, between uh, what I think is often simplistically termed a sort of art life, uh, art life practice, um, and issues of autobiography, uh, issues of um, narration and self-narration, and finally, um, issues of mortality. What I'm suggesting is that collage produces unconventional notions of community. And I'm going to um, stop my remarks there, introduce our three panelists um, very briefly, and then I'll turn it over to you. So those are just some framing, um, framing thoughts for, for how we'll uh, proceed with our conversation. Um, today we have with us Genesis Breyer Peorage, uh, who is a, a Clap for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and Kate Hardy immediately. This is kind of an amazing confab, really, uh, just if you don't know. Uh, so I'll start with a, a very quick, um, um, rapid sketch uh, of their careers and then we'll, we'll look at what you have. So uh, uh, Genesis um, uh, should need no introduction, however, uh, here we go, um, has just completed a, the first major solo, solo I guess we could call it, quasi solo, uh, show at the Warhol Museum this September. Um, Genesis, uh, Genesis' career was quasi launched in uh, 1969 with um, the co-founding of a uh, I would call it a sort of radical performance poetry group, uh, Kung Transmissions, um, in, uh, in the UK. In the early 1970s, um, Genesis met William Burroughs and Brian Geisman and began exploring the cut-up technique, uh, among other kinds of explorations that I'm sure we're going to hear about. Um, uh, she was a co-founder uh, in the early 1970s of um, the band slash performance group uh, Throbbing Gristle and a pioneer in industrial music. Um, sliding from there in 1981 to co-founding uh, a band slash group slash performance um, 
uh, sort of psychic, uh, psychic TV. In the early 1990s, Genesis began a long-term collaboration with Lady J. Breyer, in which the cut-up technique was taken uh, uh, to uh, apply to the very notion of um, discrete identities. Uh, and in that exploration, as I think we're going to hear, um, uh, uh, the two of them together developed a, a concept of the pandragine. Uh, and, and that concept takes up what we might call a painterly approach um, to the body and to identity. Um, Colette Lumiere uh, began her career in the early 1970s, and we're going to see some uh, uh, amazing images of early street art, um, which uh, very rapidly uh, expanded into elaborate, environmentally scaled collage performance, including um, sleeping works, uh, uh, sleeping works inside constructed environments. It's called the Dream, dream Beautiful. Dreamers, yeah, and he'll, he'll tell us. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that also expanded into the space of what we might call um, public interventions that took place uh, at such downtown venues as Danceteria, but uptown venues like the Whitney, the Guggenheim, and eventually the Venice uh, Biennale. Um, she has inhabited a variety of personae, ranging from Mata Hari to the Countess Rickenbach. She's also staged her own funeral. Um, which we're also going to talk about. <laughs> and she's, but she lived through it. So she's <laughs> in, in a new persona. Um, Kate Hardy is a denizen of today's downtown um, uh, performance, I would say, scene, uh, and has been exploring since the 1980s the performative nature uh, of identity, which uh, she takes up to be her material. Um, coming out of a milieu shaped by uh, post-punk, by riot girls, uh, and by a certain thinking through of the fluidity of identity, um, her practice also has uh, spread out not only from performance to spoken word uh, projects to the production of zines, print culture, um, uh, sort of paratactical fashion shows. Um, that's good, right? I gotta write that down. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it was. That's part of what you've been doing. Paratactical. Paratactical, uh, paratactical fashion. So um, we're very, very lucky to have all three here uh, at the same time in the same room. Um, and I will, without further ado, uh, turn the mics over to Genesis. Just before we begin, we should say the only reason we started doing collages was because we got beaten up at school all the time. And the only way to escape lunch times and getting beaten up was to become one of the school librarians. And it was during that time in the 60s, putting books away, that we found the Dadaists and the Surrealists. And particularly were inspired by Max Ernst. So thank you, bullies. You've given me a lifetime's work. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, we've been really sick this week, so we got our galleries to put together the list based on what we want. The ones that we were going to show you first aren't there, but what they were was um, old engravings, and then we, we got interested in the Stations of the Cross and the way that it was so important in churches and worship and organized religion. And so we decided to deconstruct that by photographing a model in a leather jock strap, a female model, biologically female, uh, with a packed jock strap. So it was a hermaphroditic image. And then we had her do all the different positions of Jesus, minus the cross. And then we took the illustrations to heaven and hell and created collages from that in black and white. So we began basically emulating to a degree the, the origins of collage, but immediately wanted to break down the story or to create a story, to not just create a world, but to also have a story in it as well. Um, 
We even experimented with yoga, holding the different positions of Christ for as long as physically possible to see if we had any interesting out-of-body experiences or spiritual revelations, but we didn't. <laughs> but we tried it. And from there we went on very privately for 30 years to collage without telling anyone or showing anyone. And as they developed, they, they, we found out, well first as we were told, we met Burroughs and, and Guy Sina who both introduced me to cut-ups. And that was how industrial music began, cutting up music to create something new, regardless of skill. So nobody could play. We didn't have a drummer, because always there were always a drummer. And then we just experimented, built our own equipment, and discovered a sound that now is a global phenomena ever since. So cutting things up and reassembling them can, as we say, create cultural engineering. You can literally affect global culture with a very few people who are dedicated and passionate. That's very important. The other thing that's important in this context for me is that we've always worked in communities and networks. During the 80s, we set up a quasi-magical anti-cult, the Temple of Psychic Youth and eventually had 10,000 people involved worldwide who would all do a sexual magical ritual on the 23rd of the month at 2,323 minutes. Which is an amazing experiment. Sometimes we would all have the same desire to make something happen, sometimes personal ones. But the idea of 10,000 orgasms coordinated through time zones the same time. It's quite a phenomena. That was how we ended up being thrown out of England. <laughs> <laughs> um, they took it very seriously and decided it must be satanic because they didn't understand. And so while we were away in Kathmandu doing soup kitchens for the Tibetans, my house was raided by Scotland Yard, and all my work, all my photos, all my videos, in, you know, filmed at burrows that had not been seen, were all destroyed by Scotland Yard. And we weren't allowed back to Britain for seven years. So it has impact. These are actually, in a way, going backwards in time, but as, you, as was mentioned, we, we met Lady J in 93 in New York. And the first day we met, there was this instant, you are my ultimate being. Total love. Unconditional love. And then the very first gesture that Jay made that night was to dress me in her clothes and decorate what we had down with dreadlocks. And we thought, well, that's interesting. And she said, you're not really a boy or a girl. And I don't feel like a boy or a girl. In fact, the human body is really uncomfortable to me because it has so many cultural connections, so many um, ways of suppressing individuality, suppressing people's innate creativity and destroying their hope, ultimately. So that's when we began to really think about that. These pictures are photographic collages, as you can tell, and they're called snowflakes. These were later images, and they're actually about 12 by 8 feet on Plexi. And we, we used to take each other's pictures, and thousands of Polaroids, and do little films, and so, for some reason that's... And then we, we, we worked through the idea of the divine hermaphrodite. If we didn't want to be told by society what we were, who we were, what gender we were, who we were supposed to be, who we were supposed to become, 
then where would that lead us? One night we came back from Europe, went to the back garden, and there were all these worms on the top of the soil, and they were all making love to themselves. And that's what those worms are there. And the rose actually fell off a tree, it wasn't placed. And then we started thinking about mouths as vaginas that speak, and it's a vagina dentata. So, these images are, are collages of that, those sorts of photographs. Um, during the 80s, we discovered somebody called Austin Osman Spare, who used to create automatic drawings, do incredible paintings, but also charge them. And ultimately that meant spilling his semen onto them. And as he did that, he had something in mind. He would write in his own alphabet the ultimate desire that he needed to have happen at that time. And then create the work as a magical act to make something happen. And that really resonated too, because it went back right to the beginning, the shaman. The days when prehistoric humanity didn't know the sun would come up again. Didn't know there would be another winter. Didn't even have a concept of linear time. And linear time was discovered, of course, by women. So there's a tradition with the shaman of doing drawings, sand paintings by the Native Americans, and, and in Tibet too, and then destroying them. But to make things happen, to change the world, hopefully for the better. And so we started to incorporate that into our collages all through the 80s. And these are some of those. They would only be made or affected or added to on the 23rd of the month. So some took months, years, to be complete. And every time we worked on them, we did rituals and kept on focusing on what was supposed to happen with the, with the sigil, as it's called. And these are all from that series. This one is interesting to mention because in the top right-hand corner is an old postcard of Brighton, the south of England. And in the left, is the palatial brothel of one of the kings and princes of England, also in Brighton. And most of the photographs, as you can see, were actually, and usually are taken by us, whenever possible. We wanted to leave London because we had two children. We wanted to move to Brighton. We didn't have any money, so we did this sigil. And then a friend said, I want to move to Brighton. Would you like to move with, it, with me? And we said, yes. And when we found the house we wanted, it looked exactly like that in the right-hand side. Exactly like that. It was quite incredible. But by then we had a saying, of course, mm -hmm. the of course factor. There are amazing things going on all the time that we don't realize because we've been numbed by the way that culture works. This one was for Derek Jarman specifically. He's down in the left corner and he was going blind from HIV AIDS. And he said to me, could you do me one of your, your magical sigils, Jane, to help me finish this film before I go blind? So we said, yes, of course. And there's Derek, there's Obviously there was a bloodletting, a healing. Um, there's a tattoo of my back with the completion tattoo of the uh, tarot cards from the Thoth deck. There. Um, filled with pins to make me really aware of completion. And God bless him, Derek finished the film. And it was beautiful, so. And we'd known Derek since the 60s. So collage doesn't just 
have to be imagery, although we always see it as something that allows you to create worlds that would otherwise not exist, um, concepts that could not exist any other way. Burroughs used to say to me, let's cut it up and see what it really says. And he was right. So these are some of the different magical, intentional pieces. Um, Androgyny. As we developed our relationship, because we stayed together from that day, myself and Jay started thinking about something Burroughs had said to me. He said, where does control lie? How can it be short-circuited? And both of us had grown up resentful of having a specific gender and having bodies that didn't always do what we wanted. <coughs> So we were thinking about this and we thought, maybe it's DNA. DNA is a recording going back to when we were all slime mold. So from that point to when you're gestated and then born into this so-called world, you've already got the history of humanity inside you. And that's reinforced by the way the fetus grows. It goes from being single-celled, double-celled, slime mold, to being a little tiny amphibian, and then a lizard, and eventually a monkey, and then one of us. So we thought, how do you break that? How do we break this prison of DNA? How do we deny its power? So that we can say, this is who we are. This is what we want to be. We don't care about what's expected, not even genetically. And so we began to do, to wear the same clothes, to wear the same makeup, the same hair, and then to start getting surgeries, the first one being a vasectomy, to say, that's it, DNA. You are no longer part of my life. And as we cut ourselves up and mimicked our behaviors, we got more and more obsessed with not being either or, the either or universe the male, female, black, white, positive, negative, that didn't seem in any way constructive. There should be what we used to call the genius factor in everyone. Everybody is capable of amazing things. But there's not that much encouragement around us. We grow up, we're born, and we're told from the beginning, through the people around us, parents, relatives, their expectations of what we'll be. We hear it when we're in the womb. And it carries on around you, peer groups, education, society. And we said, no, let's short circuit that. And we finally decided that one way we could make a visible statement to the world that we were seriously committed to trying to find out the absolute fluidity of identity by trying to look as two halves of one, in other words, being each other's half, that's why we say we. Lady J dropped her body, as she used to call it, a few years ago, in October 2007. And she now represents us in an immaterial dimension, but she still represents the pandragine there. And we still represent the pandragine here, and both of us are that pandragine. So we now exist in two worlds, one that seems to be physical and one that seems to be invisible. But we've had some interesting experiences with that. We'll just show you some more collages. This is just... One thing we should say is all we ever use are scissors and stick glue. It's a matter of pride. <laughs> to always find ways to create these collages just by precision and focus. Some of these are, are simple collages from sketchbooks. And we kind of look at those as ways to keep remembering the world is, is, is fluid, is mutable, can be changed anytime you want. As Jay says, why wake up and be the same person you were yesterday? 
why not be someone else? We're going to go through these, oh, that one before. That was a money wish. We were in the middle of a court case suing Rick Rubin and the Fireman's Fund, Insurance Fund, after we'd been in intensive care after a fire. And so we did this sigil and we borrowed $4,000 and stacked them up and took Polaroids and wished for money and a positive result from the court case. It went to the Supreme Civil Court of California and a two-week trial by jury and we won. We won $1.6 million. So don't take these things lightly. <laughs> but do remember who gets that. The lawyers. <laughs> we actually only received about 500,000, which is still fantastic. And with that we thought, there's two things we could do. Buy a house, get a car, flounce around the world. Or we can do whatever we want for at least 10 years and never have to work or think of any restrictions. So that's what we chose. And one of the first things we did after the vasectomy was to start changing our faces to be more like each other. Sorry. Um, Lady J got her nose done to be like mine. Underneath her eyes changed to be like mine. A chin implant, cheek implants. We just had cheek implants to look like her. Got tattoos of her beauty marks on my face. Under my eyebrows are her eyebrows tattooed. And then we thought, this isn't enough. This is just like a mirror image. That's great, because we are one. But let's go further. So on Valentine's Day, 2003, we got matching breast implants. And it was so liberating for us. We woke up in the post-op room from the anesthetics holding hands and looked down and the first words we spoke were, these are our angelic bodies. But angels don't have belly buttons. So now we asked the doctors, can you get rid of the belly buttons? And they said, not yet. So. <laughs> We're still waiting for that breakthrough. <laughs> but what happened was that people at first thought it was about changing gender, but it wasn't about changing gender. For us, it was creating a third being, not even a gender, a chosen identity one made from two, a unifying instead of a disrupting, separating, um, polarizing effect. And we stood as a flag, um, in a sense, daring the world to tell us we were wrong. And more revelations come when these things happen. When you push yourself like that, and you start to be perceived as both genders, you're liberated to think about what else? Jay started saying, well, why do we need to have skin? Why can't we have fur? Once you realize the human body is just a cheap, mortal suitcase, that as Timothy Leary said, is there to carry around the brain. It gives the brain mobility. It gives you the opportunity to see amazing things. And who is the you you talk to in your mind when you're discussing things in your head? It's your thoughts, it's your brain patterns, it's your conditionings, it's your rebellions. It's not the body. The body isn't you. The body is just a container. And as soon as people learn it's not sacred, and it's not specific, and doesn't have to be, and we start thinking of inclusiveness, then we can start looking at culturally engineering the species, changing the species. 
We personally would think it would be wonderful to have a human species, a divine hermaphrodite, but also just of strange creatures. And is it working, the film? <coughs> Did anyone find out if it worked? We We've been having problems with the film. We think it's going to do it. Even if it's out of sync, lead it. We wanted Lady J to speak to you tonight, today. And we made this video about eight years ago, just before she died. And it reappeared on a friend's computer last week. This, 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 this is the final war. This, 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 this. A jigsaw. A war to repossess yourself. There is no gender anymore. Only androgyny is divine. Sexual of nature. It cannot be contained. <laughs> get out, get out, get out, get out. Stand together. Join man and woman and love and love. This is the final. This, 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 this is the final war. This is the final war. This, 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 this. called the Mad Hatter. Uh, and these are where we started doing that. But this is the last one. She was lying down asleep in this little white dress and didn't know that it had ridden up and was wearing these bright red panties. And we had that lying around with just the word perfect written underneath. And then we were asked to put something into an exhibition for Valentine's Day. And out of nowhere, click, we just flipped it round four ways. And we, this is called My Funny Valentine. <laughs> so it just shows you, you never know where you can go. The more you chop things up and reassemble them and keep doing it year after year, as we, we once asked Burroughs, this is the last remark, <coughs> once asked Burroughs, you know, do you still do cut-ups all the time with your books? And he said, rarely, because my brain's mutated, and it just does them anyway. <laughs> and that's something that we found has happened with images. They assemble themselves just from nowhere, from the deep brain. They're just milling around, and all of a sudden they'll tell me, this is what we're meant to be. So they change themselves. It's a very fascinating world. Thank you. There's so much material to cover. So, you want me to do the video first? I'm not going to do this to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think we're going to play a short documentary, like a, actually a trailer of a documentary that was done in 92, when I already had a long career. And then I'll fill in, some slides are missing, and then I can always answer questions, because there's a lot of material. I'm not the kind of artist that wakes up at 8 and goes to my studio and paints and leaves the studio at five and goes on to normal life. That's never been my way of working. I live and then I make my art, and I'm a bit of a Toulouse-Lautrec. I need to absorb a lot out of life. I go out at night, I love to dress up, and I also love to just work, you know, and just like look like a bag lady during the day sometimes and just get myself all full of paint and, you know, sort of a 
Yeah, sort of making a fantasy at night and during the day. Well, I, in the day, it's a fantasy too, but it's reality. That's the point. It's not a fantasy. And I, that's the thing I like to bring out in my work because it is about, in a way, it's about miracles and magic, and it's very, uh, I hope it's spiritual, but it's real. I'm always trying to make people see that magical things are real. Colette is a visionary artist. Her work is intensely personal yet very public at the same time. For over 20 years, she has baffled critics and the art world with her wide variety of art objects and innovative use of location and space. Perhaps best known for her environments, she creates haunting, lyrical spaces which hide, reflect, and showcase her all at once. Colette uses soft, delicate fabrics, found objects, and paint and transforms every detail of her environment into an otherworldly layer. Her street works, window display tableaus, and performances have given her a notoriety few artists enjoy. At home in New Wave clubs, as well as major museums, Colette builds work based upon several major themes. Seduction, dreaming, sleeping, death, identity, and the female form and persona. Colette transforms herself into other personas, like Justine. These personas consist of complex ideas given form by various characters. Justine and others challenge our assumptions about art, as well as the role of women, both in art and society. Well, she uh, intersects two traditions. One is the uh, creation of the artist persona, uh, be it be Joseph Boris or Andy Warhol, or uh, the, the creation where the creation of that persona becomes fully inseparable from the artwork. Uh, a more recent example would be uh, McDermott and McGuff, Jeff Koons. Also in that, the fact that she uh, functions uh, anachronistically, uh, 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 drawing things from various times in history, from various uh, uh, periods, and uh, seems to like have uh, taken apart uh, an idea of a sequential narrative history of, in fact, of progress. Uh, that is sort of a, a, one of the sort of fundamental sort of postmodern tenets. And also the other thing is the separation of art and life. She's really a source in a way. She used photography and ripped up photographs before other people did. Uh, used herself as a feminist, used herself, uh, her persona, her body, uh, long time before Cindy Sherman, for instance, and many other artists. So uh, art historically, she's very much of a source in the 70s for what happened in the 80s. So I'm trying to think how I can contribute to the theme, which is collage, feminism, and um, I guess through my work. And I can say that I started as a painter, but almost simultaneously wanted to take art out of the canvas. And I started creating these inner sculptures where I became part of it. Oh, I better show you some pictures. <laughs> well, the first one, how do I go back? Do you know? The arrows. Yeah, left and right arrow. Okay. That just shows you one of the many street works I did in the 70s. And I always um, performed them as rituals, usually in the early morning hours, because I thought those hours were magical. Plus, I would avoid the police. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Not always. Um, soon after that, actually almost at the same time, the slides are out of order a little bit, so I'll explain and maybe um, a few are missing, so I'll fill in. Uh, this is moving forward. The image that was used to advertise this panel was of myself in my living environment, which was like an art, which was an artwork that kept transforming itself, and I transformed myself with it. It was like a second skin, and one could say that my whole life and my space was a huge collage. And within that collage, I produced artworks, whether they were uh, frescoes almost, uh, what would be frescoes in a, big, in a monument, you know, where I would say fragments. Um, I would make photo works. I would 
work with the photographs, and I think Peter Sells in the documentary, I wish they elaborated more on what he said because it was really, he said a lot of more important things that pertain particularly to the values collage. But anyway, back to this image here. It's 1975. It was in a place called the Ideal Warehouse uh, next to the clock tower. And it was a very innovative space, alternative space, Alana High's ran. And it was an installation where I slept with Muzak. I incorporated sound in a lot of my rooms. And here, projections. And it was called, If It Takes Forever, I Will Wait For You. And the funny thing is, uh, after the opening, there were hardly any audience there, and I was there every day. <laughs> I think I had one person who had a loft next door who was a filmmaker, and he would come and watch me. <laughs> and that made, it didn't matter, you know, I had to do what I had to do. It was a ritual, and anyway, so this one of many of the 70s works. I want to go back to the environment because well, okay, we'll do it in this order. This one is the Paris Biennale, 77, the title, Let Them Eat Cake. I had already been quite well known for the um, pieces I had done that were similar. I would create a landscape and became part of it. A big inspiration was the chameleon, blending in an environment. nineteen seventy three this is going back my early career and this is the room of a gallery where the gallerist actually allowed me to totally destroy his office so I could create an environment and it was called the transformation of the sleeping gypsy without the lion usually well in this picture I'm not sleeping for the photograph but I would be sleeping when people came in and one of the very important aspects of these rooms, which uh, were often misunderstood at the beginning, as my work was actually mostly a lot by the feminists, which is ironic, I will explain that later, is uh, there was a very, you know, people saw the sensual aspect of it and was often criticized because of it. But for me, the main thing was the transformative aspect of it. Entering these rooms would put you in a different state. And I can't explain that by showing you the image, but I can tell you, and hopefully I can make a room soon and you could experience that. I'm dehydrated. <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs> and I don't drink. I'm still absorbing your story. <laughs> I hope you don't want me to have a sex change. Get a needle. <laughs> anyway. Become a lizard. <laughs> no, no, no. They sleep a lot. No. Oh, I see. No, no. <laughs> there has to be better ways. Okay. So, now we move forward. In the 70s, I created these rooms, and I got pretty well known for creating them. Often I would be naked in the room, which again got the wrong attention from people and opened me to criticism, but it was the idea of returning to the womb in a way. And just, well, I consider myself a visionary, so right there, I'm not very good with words. I like art to talk through symbols, the symbols of art. And my search was like trying to understand the invisible through making art. But by, by 78, I was pretty well known. And I was really continuing to create this installation. I already had a show at the Whitney where um, I showed works at the Whitney. Before that, at the Museum of Modern Art, I did Camille, where I slept in an installation. And actually, the fragments of the piece from the Paris Biennale, the exterior, which was actually uh, very, hard materials, usually I'm known for soft material, but it was almost like the skin of an animal, um, were shown at the Museum of Modern Art, and ironically, as I'm speaking to you, they are right down here in the basement somewhere. Huge <laughs> installation. So we must let the curators know. <laughs> anyway, uh, also my environment 
the, uh, which I will show you and which has been used to advertise. It's also in storage, but I'm taking care of it. Leo Castelli tried to put it in a museum, and we came very close to it in 81, and due to uh, circumstances beyond our control, the museum was taking it and things fell through, so it's still in storage, and I hope before I go I'm able to reconstruct it in a museum or in a space that's permanent. So, oh, 78. So 78, being wildly imitated by the commercial world. You know, I started painting the streets anonymously. You know, I want, it's, it's not that I didn't want to be famous, I wanted to be a great artist, quote. And at the time, I also thought maybe making a film would be interesting. Like you, I was interested in magic in a very different way. I expressed that. But in a way, we have this, I think artists in general, if they're genuine, have the same search to know, discover the unknown. And um, I was trying to do a film without any financing, as you will understand. <laughs> on a woman who fell to earth and was trying to communicate with her peers. And there came the ideas of painting the streets, which had element of, elements of graffiti because I would be doing this illegally. And it was a pirate element in my work that still is very present. But I was doing it actually to communicate with uh, the unknown. Anyway. Where was I? Justine. Okay. So by the time Justine came, I was doing these environments. My personal look was very, was very public. You know, I was in a lot of magazines like Artists in the 70s. I mean, this is why I find interesting, this generation. In the 70s, if you were a woman artist, you were not supposed to wear lipstick. You know, already you were not serious. And dressing up was totally out of the question. <laughs> so I think my strength as a feminist, actually, was that I really didn't understand what a feminist was. To me, there were these women that hated men and had to do weird things. And they didn't like me very much. And they looked like men. And they were doing man's work. And they really did not like me. And I didn't understand because I was a woman. <laughs> well, this maybe came from my childhood, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But you know, when I was little, I, did, I went to Catholic school, and I didn't go to the class because I was not a Catholic. And then the little children went, you killed Jesus. <laughs> so who knows, maybe that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> but it affected me. I said, look, I just want to be an artist. You know, I'm a visionary. <laughs> You know, I come from the school of Oridon, you know, probably artists you haven't heard of, like John Graham, I hope you have, um, Cornell, you know, the La Francesca, Picabia. You know, I, I was just going to do my own thing, and that was actually the most feminist act I could do, because my work actually celebrated femininity, which was like a dirty word, you know, like using soft materials, dressing up, fashion. I incorporated fashion in my work. So anyway, by the 70s, people were still trying to figure out, is she serious or not? <coughs> I was performing, I was having exhibitions. I, I had uh, exhibitions in museums, but I still was having big trouble financing my life. You know what I mean? I'm not your co-owner, you know? <laughs> Nothing against her. You know, I'm not putting anybody down, by the way, but just to make something clear here. Survival is a very difficult thing for an artist. Month to month, if you like. Yeah. Um, so I saw that everywhere I went, I brought this, I brought, by the way, the idea of the street art to, um, to the windows in the street. This way I could create environments. My work is very private. At the same time, it's, as the documentary says, in their own words, not all mine. I always wanted to reach a, hot, a bigger public. You know, it's always like an innate drive for me. So I found different ways to reach people on different levels. You know, in other words, the art audience, well, which was not totally supporting me anyway, um, was only one aspect. I love the idea of reaching out without people knowing. Like, so when people walk by these windows I would create, for shop windows or whether they would let me, or 
support me. Um, I create a very intimate world, magical world, that people, passerbys, would go by and just look. And sometimes they would stop and sometimes they would look into it further. Or not, but somehow I felt like I added some magic to their lives. And for me that was very important. And I think that's why art is so important. And I think that's why art remains, okay? So, bottom line, the commercial world kept copying me. I kept struggling to make art and make myself heard as a serious artist and continue working and pay the rent and still continue to, you know, make these light boxes and photo works or whatever. And uh, I invented Justine. I died at the Whitney Museum in a piece called Out of My House, which was a reconstruction of my living environment. And as a performance, instead of dying like Sleeping Beauty by the needle, I died by the staple gun. <laughs> I used myth, fairy tales to me, and myths too, you know, as references for my work and inspiration. So Justine became my first living persona. Colette is my real name. Like the writer, I dropped the last name. Um, so Justine stood for justice. I saw real contradictions in our culture. Why the artist who's supposed to be someone elevated and looked upon is so degraded <laughs> and treated so badly so often during his lifetime. You know, like Van Gogh, thank God he had a brother, but he died mad, you know, and Monk with a scream and Frida Kahlo, who were, every uh, pop star wants, wanted to be Frida Kahlo in the movie and refers to her as their heroine and role model, well, Frida did not have such a pleasant ending, as we know. So, I don't know, I guess I knew what I was getting myself into, but I wanted to be an artist, but I wanted to make a statement that would remain an art statement about this situation I found myself in. Justine became the creator of the, of the Colette is Dead company. She created products inspired by Colette's image, which the commercial world was copying, but the art world was looking upon me as not quite serious, you know? That's why I relate to drag queens a lot, you know? <laughs> um, so, it just didn't make any sense to me, so I made art out of it, and I did it very well. I, and I, I uh, started a band, I'm not really a musician by any means, but I had a band which was called Justine and the Victorian Punks, and the street works continued. I posted, or what do you call it, post? What, what do they call it now, what the graffiti artists do? Images of this band all over town. And I, to, at the beginning, it was a band that performed but did not play, and then soon after that I began playing. And there were a series of actions besides making the products. But the, by 1978, Fiorucci knew about my work, of course, and he was generous enough to invite me to do a window at, in his store, you know? And he treated me very well, was very generous. And there were posters, and I slept in the window during the duration of the show. And he let me be Justine all the way. I destroyed the whole store during the opening performance, and he didn't seem to mind, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was great, you know? And, uh, but at the beginning, I wasn't doing windows. I just did them anywhere, you know? And uh, Justine was also the head of the Colette estate, you know, because as we know, like a lot of people take great pride in being in the art world. I do not support contemporary artists, but make their reputation out of dead artists and are very, actually, very um, condescending. My English is not very good. Towards a living artist, and I always found that to be a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So this, this um, going sculpture, I called it, a parody on the dilemma of an innovative contemporary artist, continued from 78 to 82. Oh, I don't know what, oh, this is Justine herself in the living environment, a detail of it. So it showed you how it became one with the environment. I don't know if I mentioned this, but the chameleon. Oh, yeah. yeah, you must have known because you said, yeah. <laughs> was uh, the idea of adjusting to one's environment for protection, the womb as protection. But all of these are things that I rather, you know, unlike you, you, you speak very well. I always refrain from talking. I was not good at it. And 
It was very frustrating in the 70s too, which makes things more complicated, because I didn't want to answer questions in an interview. You know, I just felt like I was stronger with my images and talking about them would kind of belittle them, you know? So anyway, um, Justine also, uh, at the beginning, was had this Victorian punk look. And then, uh, wait, the picture before, what was that thing to? Yeah, this was the Victorian punk look. And actually, this is at PS1, where I created my own tomb, the tomb for Colette. And this is a big lot, uh, light box, you know, in the middle that moved up and down, and right in the center of the body, you, it was the eighth hole from miniature golf. Because, <laughs> you know, I was dealing with function in art. <laughs> well, function. Actually, this is very important, and I don't want to talk too much, because um, this whole thing is I prove that artists are not mad. Artists are driven mad, maybe, but they're not mad, and I wanted to prove that I could very well be a commercial artist, but I chose not to. All I wanted to prove is put my vision out there and just kind of question, question the role of the artist in our society. And anyway, so this piece was a tune. Oh, I know why. I, I pointed to this because right after that I started creating these beautiful dreamer uniforms that were second skins that were inspired by the walls of the environment. The walls themselves were like paintings with fabrics. If you looked at one of them from far away, and I would embed a picture very often of a performance, sometimes I would use light. Light was a very consistent element. Um, the uniforms themselves became a work, and I walking with them was an experiment in walking architecture. This is me as Justine. So I created a product, again, the beautiful dream of uniform. And also, you can go on and on about the symbols of what a uniform means and that we all wear one, and I leave that to you. Okay, 78, this is before the uniforms, or right in, no, it's in the process of the uniforms because I remember I had them in there. This is a window in a Victorian thrift shop. I know you like thrift shops too, and we can't live without them. Um, anyway, uh, a Victorian, thrift shop, a very beautiful shop, and I wore a lot of bloomers then, and I wore undergarments over my clothes. Anyway, I did this piece called Paranoia is Heightened Awareness. And in this picture, I pose as Joan of Arc, because a big, a big story came out on me in Arts Magazine, and ironically, when I was going to meet my friends, the Victorian punks, to pose for the picture. There was a cover of Anne's Joan of Arc. So I've kind of appropriated the image of Anne's picture into my own version, which I would do with many historical themes. Art themes, whether they would be mythology, art history, or uh, literature, like Camille, for example. All right, so. Inside the store, I would have a fashion performance, as you see, you know, other fashion performance, an artist doing a pack. Oh, no, that's not serious. <laughs> but a week later, the Mud Club would do the, ex kind of imitated the whole show, you know, by a fashion designer, and I even participated in one of them, and uh, offered the Deadly Feminine Line, which was my trademark for the Coletta's Dead Company. And I, I posed almost naked with this veil, as a dress, you could see right through it, and this dress was taken seriously in the newspapers with all the other designers, and it was for sale for $37,000. So it reminds me a bit of Robert Allman, you know, the movie uh, Ready to Wear? But that's what we're dealing with. But anyway, I did not, I was not interested in entering the commercial world, and I think the, I did it so well, though, I had an album with my band, which actually was re-released two years ago, the Beautiful Dreamer album, which was my theme song, Beautiful Dreamer, put to a disco beat. And it was re-released by DFA because they thought the whole thing was so ahead of its time. I worked with Peter Gordon, a wonderful musician, and they wanted to re-release it as an old album, and they did. And the cover, well, I don't want to say this, you discover it yourself, was sepia color, and I was laying there with a cross, 
um, sleeping on a bed in one of my boudoir window installations where I would project the music on the street. So, Justine, one of the reasons I'm, a lot of my pictures are about Justine because I find her so prophetic, like artist prophetic. And as uh, I think we all have experienced, I've done so many artworks where I look back later and I don't have the images here. My God, how did I know? You know, like I knew visually, you know, like after September 11, I realized that I painted these images way before in my paintings of uh, what my studio was going to look like afterwards. And one of them was even called Premonition. Okay, so here we go, ripping myself off, Joan of Arc. Colette is dead company. Okay, 81, I already have a retrospective, and I'm still Justine. But I think I picked this image because it shows you, because we don't have so much time, how the objects, besides the performance, you have everything here, everything was minimal. Like the performance was minimal, it was a creation of Olympia, which later became a persona name, but that's not the same Olympia to me making the doll a reality. You know, in the environment, I represented a living doll. And this also caused a lot of confusion with the feminists. <coughs> because they thought maybe I was bringing, you know, feminism back to the cavemen. You know, why are women represented as dolls? And I was not representing that at all. I was representing the human condition as I saw it, controlled perhaps by outside forces we know nothing about, or at least questioning them. And art for me, and the art of creation, was a way to transcend everything, to be free, to transcend all the disasters of life that we have to go through and uh, survive in a way that's heroic and dignified. So I think, I'm sorry you can't see the light box here because they were called bed series and there was a nude body of myself laying down from above in the bed, and the photographs were torn, and you could see the light behind it. And some people thought I was such an egomaniac because I used my image, which so many artists use now, but at that time, it was still like, why does she use her picture all the time? <laughs> well, I'm sure we don't want to say any names. A lot of people don't have to say. Well, anyway, let's move forward. <laughs> let's fast forward. Why further? So anyway, one of the pieces like that's in the Collage Center now, it's a uh, more recent piece, but it's like the panels you see in the background where the fabrics are used like paint, like three-dimensional paint, but they are soft fabrics that I modify and I transform before I use them. And I think in that one is a picture of me sleeping in Radio City, a record store in 1980. I think the one in the middle actually came from the living environment. And the left one is actually a fragment of the living environment. The rest is explanatory, you know, the beautiful dreamer uniform and the furniture. In that show, I also had photographs, I had collages, I had streetwear collages, and light boxes. This is only one of the views of the walls in detail. But that's 1981. So, not knowing what to do, as fate would have it, I get a DA Day grant in 1983. Just at the time, I was taking down my living environment, which was really, really uh, traumatic. It was like shedding a skin, you know, it's like really like the metamorphosis of the cocoon, the butterfly, whatever, all these metaphors, but I was living it. Uh, but thank God I got an invitation to live in Berlin for a year, and I stayed two years, and my persona for Berlin was Mata Hari and the stolen potatoes. Because for me, Berlin offered a sense of mystery, and the wall was still up, and there was, in a way, it was very mysterious, and I just wanted to kind of communicate that every persona had a philosophy. I look at them as guides, uh, spirit guides. It's not so much I'm so-and-so, it's more like so-and-so becomes my guide. Because I think artists at their best are very good mediums. If they can translate or communicate or deliver or manifest 
what's in their vision or what they receive in a material, physical form, that's their job. So, okay, Matahari became my vehicle. And in this image, you have a picture of myself as Matahari in front of the Berlin Walls and the stolen potatoes, which became a symbol, of course, of, we all know that in art, the ordinary become extraordinary and potato became a symbol. And I have one in my bag, actually. And this was from an exhibition I did a little later. So the beautiful, it was kind of a retrospective. So I have the potato sculpture with a blackbird, which was a symbol I used in Munich, uh, a quote. But the uniform shows you how the beautiful dreamer uniforms were pieces of art in themselves and sculptures. I wore them and then I preserved them. That one was actually used in a public piece that was on television called Justine for the People, where I stood on Wall Street on a platform near the Washington statue. Am I gone? I don't know. I didn't mean to take so much time. Is it too long? Because I realized it was too long and I was going to be short. Okay. So fast forward, another persona. Uh, Countess Harschenbach, I'm invited to go to Munich, I'm back in New York, back and forth, I don't want to lose my loft. Uh, in Berlin I did the sets and costumes of the Berlin Opera, I go to Munich, I'm invited, I fall in love, I have a studio, I stay there. And um, created the Countess Harschenbach, which just inspired my, my personal life, but was a fictitious character, because my boyfriend's mother was Countess Harschenbach, I lived on Harschenbach's Straße. <laughs> etc., etc. So I was so bored in Munich, you know, but I created a lot of works. <laughs> yeah, my friend, my boyfriend actor at the time says, oh God, this is such a sleepy town. So, but anyway, it was very inspiring in the way that I was a uh, creation. I was so creative there because that was my way out and he was in the theater all night, so I created also a service called Dalsi for Scandal because I felt artists like myself again, were invited to all these parties because I looked different, I looked exotic. Colette from New York is here, but I really started to resent it because one, it took a lot of time, but two, I, I don't think they understood my work at all. So I created a Darcy for Scandal service where I made images from, and this is a multimedia collage, as you could see how the images turn into collages and constructions. And I inspired by the big collage, my life, and uh, in this service, people had to hire me to come to a party. I never really did that. I was not interested. My phone rang all day and night. I had to change it. I was interested in, again, the communi communicating that idea. Then there's another construction of, uh, oh, the House of Olympia. I'm back, in New I'm back in New York in the 90s. After a long sojourn in Berlin, Munich, New York, I kept the loft. I came back to New York. I was getting bored with the clanziness. I was so happy. <laughs> On Facebook, uh, Pavel said he was so happy to be back to New York. And it made me think, like, when I saw the dirt on the streets of New York in the early 90s, I go, oh, I was about to kiss the ground. <laughs> so anyway, back in New York, what do I do now? So I create the House of Olympia. And the House of Olympia, Oh, it was a time of very political art. By that time, I think I was much more accepted by the feminists, you know? In fact, a lot of artists, women particularly, but men as well, were inspired by my work, were working with similar themes, genre, and everything. And so uh, that problem was not there anymore, but the problem of uh, survival still was. <laughs> so anyway, the House of Olympia was kind of a Noah's Ark because I had come back to New York and saw how my vision had um, been interjected in the real world, and one of the, every persona, I think I told you, had a, had a theme, had rules, and the, one of the rules was retrieving my history, um, the return to children with manners. Oh, I know, it was a time of very political art, and my work was not very, what do you call it, What is it? Politically correct. Politically, well, very politically incorrect. Okay, I didn't mean to do it, but I had to do it. Because I really felt that art was about elevating the spirit. To me, that was the reason for art. And so I continued in that vein. 
and I won't go into the whole thing. A collage four by eight feet of myself in 18th century costumes, and I politicized people, other people than myself, and masterpieces from the 18th century. I had salons in my loft. Try to make things a little friendlier with the sexes where all this chaos was going on. And uh, within each persona, I would also either appropriate other well-known uh, artists, like I say, or be inspired by mythology or inspired by literature, but also by great women and sometimes men. This one happens to be Sarah Bernhardt, and it's do done with paper and Xeroxes, and it's myself as Sarah Bernhardt, and it's a big collage, four by six. And I, astrologically, I had a lot in common with Sarah Bernhardt, who I found out later, after I had done the clock tower piece, slept in a coffin. Anyway, another theme you might have seen in the documentary is the theme of uh, thrift shops, fashion, incorporating fashion in my work. And this is a show I did in the meat market district in a Japanese gallery. And you know, the Japanese have a different view on art and fashion. So they had fashion and art, they had a gallery, and in the bottom floor they had a gallery, uh, upstairs a gallery space, downstairs. A, a very special boutique. So I put in my life for sale. The bed was always a central element, whether it was in the environment and has inhabited a lot of my installations. And I forgot to tell you, as Olympia, I replaced my presence with a Colette mannequin sculpture. I started to do that more and more. I still would appear live like I did as a pope in the windows of Montreal, you know, and I would bless people. But uh, very often I would put, oh, it really worked. I, I could talk about that for hours, but I won't. Can, can we, anyway, so this is a very um, theme that is recurring. Okay, so I think I have to wrap it up. We, yeah, we can come back to some of these images. It's okay. I just want to make sure we have time. Yeah, I just want to say this one. This one is my uh, studio, Laboratoire Lumière, which was a place that was like a modular artwork where I kept all my art, my history, and invented things. And this is right before Sandy, and one of the pieces that was going to the Collage Center that has an image in it, right before Sandy this was taken. So that's it. Okay, I will, this will be, fairly short because I don't, I don't even have the experience and, and years that y'all have of making art, although, oh, oops, how did I do that? Um, sorry, I'm going, I'll try not to. Well, we can look. Um, and I mean, I really, um, I really identify a lot with what you said, Colette, um, and how artists are treated and how things can be belittled in a sort of performance way. And um, also, um, yeah, I mean, I don't have that much more to say because I think our conversation will be interesting, but for me, the thing, you know, when thinking about collage and coming here, um, I, I thought about how the two images create a tension and an imperfection, and, you know, in a way, you know, you, you lose the um, even ability to, to how to be a master, you know, it's sort of like sort of anti-patriarchal in this way because it's not it's not clear. There's always a tension, there's always a relationship that the people can jump around and guess at by looking at um, what's juxtaposed. So there's no, you know, there's no specific genius and end point to it. And I think that that, you know, is a thread that goes that there's no, you know, the work itself has its life because the collage creates these tensions and that's all. So I just, those are my images.
And I'll turn it over to Judith. Um, I want to pick up a couple of things. One has to do with the notion of cultural engineering, and I think each one of you has done a kind of cultural engineering um, that works in obviously different ways. There, there are certain questions that emerge for me that have to do with anachronism, mastery, I think it's a very useful term, and, and one's relationship to concepts of mastery, um, the recombinant. Right. Whether we're thinking about DNA yeah. um, uh, or recombinant technologies, um, then something that you you've all touched on in different moments and in different ways, but maybe sort of glanced around, has to do particularly with something like fashion that disparaged um, appendage to the high art world and the relationship between fashion and the instruments of fashion, whether that's print culture, um, you know, actual uh, uh, costume, the exterior cladding that you know, the architecture of the body takes on, um, and then thinking about the body itself as this kind of recombinant object, be it yoga or faux yoga or, I don't know, uh, exercise. Um, uh, different types of modification. Um, uh, I think these are all uh, things worth to, worth exploring. Um, further to that, the question of anonymity and publicity. What it means to Genesis, you said you had this 30 year basically private anonymous um, practice and, and now you're in a place where that practice has gone public. Has gone public, right? Um, so that that um, uh, that says to me there's something about archiving, not just mining the archive. Those first images that you were talking about as a librarian, I found that very provocative. What it means to be a kind of librarian um, in a you know good sexy way, um, a librarian of historical culture, historical images, librarian of. Uh, uh, clothing of fashion, of uh, concepts, of, a librarian of um, fashion magazines and appendages, a librarian of uh, bits and pieces of language. So I'm going to, I'll throw that out as a sort of potential persona um, in a very perverse way, the, the notion of the, the librarian. And what can I, can I have any, some irony, just for a moment? Mm -hmm. um, we agree with that. We, one thing we, we all seem to have done and you have to, is have an eye for interesting but potentially banal things. One day we were walking around trying to explain to a, a niece of mine how, how we came up with ideas or how we assembled things. And we said, it's easy, you just take one object and we picked up a golden shoe and something else and we just picked up a, a horn from a box of horns and put, put the horn on the heel of the shoe and said, and now you've got a shoe on. <laughs> and we were just talking earlier that it got, then got exhibited in the court of Holden, it's now in a private collection. Um, but the archiving was an obsession for me. We had rows of filing cabinets. We kept all the correspondence going back to letters when we were 11. And having been thrown out of England for the art we made, first of all, we were doing the collages of the Queen and got sentenced to a year in prison and a large fine and then eventually on appeal didn't get sent to the prison but still had to pay the money and that was when we realized that collage can have immense power it was actually threatening an establishment enough that they tried to put me away and then they actually tried even harder in 1991 and one of the things that set them off was a show we did as Coombe Transmissions in 76 called Prostitution. And amongst it, was, there was a wall that was left. And we thought, what can we put on the wall? And then 
this word came into my head, Tampax Romana. <laughs> so we made these four light boxes and we put these little sculptures in, all using these tampons. One of them was an Art Deco clock with the insides taken out, filled with used tampons from a month. And it was called, It's That Time of the Month. <laughs> Another one was a box with a lot of, of uh, human hair with a tampon inside. It was called Larvae. And another one was a little doll's house room with uh, a tampon with little doll's arms and legs. And it was called Living Womb. Now that seemed to me like it was obviously humorous. <laughs> there were questions in Parliament. The Queen sent law lords down to close down the, the ICA gallery because she owned the building. And now the tape Britain has bought the tampon boxes. <laughs> Just this year. And my archive, what was left of it. Scotland Yard destroyed everything they took, but what was left was also bought by the tape Britain. Irony upon irony. And they actually said when they said we're buying the archive, do we get the tampon sculptures? <laughs> I said, sure if you want them. <laughs> and then we got all these ridiculous letters. Is it possible for us to put a different glass on the front? Would that interfere with the concept? Do you mind if we get screws that look a little bit like those? But I, you know, I said, I don't care. <laughs> Should we keep them in four boxes or one? I don't care. It was a joke. <laughs> and they get so precious about something and forget that there were questions in Parliament and police raids. And they threatened to take away my passport over those same sculptures. So there's a living energy inside these things. It's like the body falls out, as someone else said, you said, I think. Somebody said about the body falling out of the picture. The first painting we ever did was a painting of the outline of a woman and then an actual wooden shape of a woman painted but that stood on the floor. Or you could put it anywhere else and it was still part of the painting. It could be in a different room. So from the very beginning, we were interested in breaking away frameworks, breaking away the rigidities of any kind. And there's much more innate power involved than you would ever imagine. And the 70s was, was an age of people often deciding to ignore the galleries. The most interesting artists were working in the street and doing, you know, agit prop as we used to call it, just appearing in subway cars and suddenly all leaping around and create characters and live them for a whole week. Um, and now it's being reassessed. There was a gap for ages in the art history, the 70s, a huge amount of work that was ignored. The feminist work, the performance work, anything that they couldn't just pigeonhole. And it's amazing to me and thrilling that it's being reassessed. Didn't mean to talk that long, so. <laughs> I, I don't I think I talked enough but uh, particularly well this is an interesting time because some of us went to Sandy and I showed you the last of my uh, laboratoire but thank God I saved a lot but I understand what it means I called an ar archivist you know the word and as Olympia I was becoming very aware of that too I was retrieving my history in a way I was involved with that and I guess any personal like, action I took, if it was really honest and sincere and came from a, let's say, better place, it would resonate in feminism, art, or art in general. What's your archive like? I mean, I have a pretty rad archive, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I get worried that I'm a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to, um, have this intellectual uh, context to, for me to 
reconsider it as a library. So I thank you for that. <laughs> of us, as different as we are, we have a lot in common. <laughs> I think um, our, our time, we have about 15 minutes left, uh, and I, would you welcome conversation from the audience? Could we record, do you want? Just speak. I don't think yeah, that's the thing. Well, I was just curious, you know, the, the, the two artists on the panel versus maybe Kate, you know, seem to be before sort of digital photography and digital modification that's now sort of, you know, the established norm. And I was curious how people think that might or might not have affected collage sort of in the general sort of sense that, you know, people are now, maybe we live with it more or not. And is it easier or harder with these tools? Do you'd be surprised how many young students come up to me and say, what software do you use? <laughs> and we say, scissors and glue. <laughs> and they look baffled, like, who makes that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, for me, as, as came out, uh, it was always a very intimate thing, making these collages. It was a way for transforming and revisualizing the world over and over privately. We still do them all the time. Um, but we may never show them again. <laughs> it's 30 years. So uh, it's not something we want to do digitally. We love Polaroids because they're liquids. And there's no duplicates. Everyone's original. And some of the big collages have hundreds of Polaroids cut up onto them. Um, and that's it. They're all originals. Uh, thank God Lady J took so many, because we're still using them up like a funny valentine, and there's loads more to come. So, uh, she's still working away. <laughs> Do you want to follow up? follow up. I mean, I guess I'll follow up as being uh, uh, the artist who had the um, choice to make her work um, I hate to talk about myself. There, I could have I, all my work could have been digital, but not, none of it is digital. It's all done analog, either in the dark room or with scissors and paste. Um, and I don't know. I, I often I wonder about that question as well, and how easy it is to collage um, images digitally. Uh, they all have the same surface. Something though, is don't not. They? Yeah, it's something. Yeah, it is about texture, and it is something else about the life that that printed object had. I'm not. I'm not really. I, I'm just trying to figure it out. You know, myself in a way. Um, but it seems that a lot of the digital collage is just trying to fool us into believing it's a real image and not, and it, for me, collage is about that stark juxtaposition, I don't know. Well, you also, I mean, to think about the cut, you know, collage is, is not just an assemblage, it's also about cutting, and that's a, that can be very physical or it can be completely abstract. I do do collages with my finger on my Instagram, actually. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> there, there goes, okay. there. <laughs> We still use hairdressers' scissors. <laughs> we have a big pile of them because we're always losing them and then finding them again. <laughs> but there's a lot of experience that's lost if it's digital to me. It's like in the 60s, just to get hold of a Henry Miller or a Burroughs book was almost impossible because they were banned still as obscene. But we found out you could get them in Soho in London and in the porno shops because they'd been told they were obscene. So they stopped them. <laughs> they never read them, but they stopped them. So we would hitchhike from Birmingham down to London. It would take hours. And then have nowhere to stay, so wander around Piccadilly till someone offered to let us crash on the floor. Then wander around Soho, going into porno shops, finding these books, Jean Genet and so on. And then hitchhike back home. So there was three days. <laughs> And all the hitchhiking involved meeting people you would never otherwise meet. 
Now you go and go click on Amazon. What have we lost in that experience? An immense amount of unrealized experience, memories, other people's stories, lost to convenience. That's one of the things that makes me very wary. Jean-Paul Gaultier upsets me because I'll tell you why, because there's so few museums, okay? And there's so many great artists who are still living, struggling to just continue to create, which is not trying to make a part of. That's what I was trying to do as Justine. Justine was so prophetic and in a way as a little bit frustrated that I am, even though I'm known that I'm not as successful in some areas as I would like to be to make it easier for me to create. I'm also very thankful that I have not been corrupted because at the moment, the art world is in a very strange place. And I think it's because the pressure of our culture. You can't point your finger at one museum, one artist, one curator, one pop person, because it's really our culture. We're promoting, get fake. My kids, I teach at SVA. I teach to advertising students. You know, I'm doing my best to, put, to have them not lose their soul, you know, really. Because everybody, including interns that come in and out of my house, um, everybody is taught even in colleges to make it, make it at any expense. And this, we're creating monsters. And I certainly created monsters. And mm -hmm. I learned that phrase actually from Malcolm Morley. I'll never forget it because uh, he's a painter. I don't know if you know him. He's very famous in the 70s and 80s, still famous. Uh, and he said when he did New Realism, everybody started imitating his style. He was so successful. And he said, I created monsters. And that keeps coming to me. I literally created monsters. But that's not our fault, you know, it's like if you're going to use religion as a metaphor, it's not Christ's fault that everybody kills themselves, you know. You know, it's that kind of thing, but we need to do something about it. I have a question for Kate, because um, mm -hmm. we were talking about, t just now, um, kind of the effect, the technology effect. And I think, and there's been a lot of talk recently about, in articles about how the technology kind of engenders a sort of loneliness or you know, it, 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 it cuts us off from, from this physical experience and so on. So I'm wondering if for you, particularly for you, um, the, um, the, you know, this cutting and pasting or this, you know, kind of the physicality of, of the collage process, you know, is, is a response in some way to, you know, to, to, to the sort of bombardment of the technology, I don't know, or the, you know, that sense of the loss of the hand, I guess. I mean, I don't really, I, I don't know, it's a good question. I mean, uh, the cutting and pasting I've been doing since bef before we all had computers, 
So it's just kind of a natural sketching process for me to make collages in that sort of literal sense that you know we're talking about a bit here today. Um, but um, yeah, I think for uh, but what, then what I currently do like this is a collaging in the dark room. In a way, it is a response because it's like it slows it down and it edits the experience. And I can't bring my cell phone into the dark room, you know, and I can't be online, there can't be a screen. And you can really take time with the tactileness of the images, and, and they're not on a screen, you know. And I mean, I so it, I find that helpful in my process. So, um, even though it would be much easier or fast, not easier, but faster if I were to make this kind of work digitally, I, would, I wouldn't know what work to make. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, the computer screen is like a trash can to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, so. Look how many problems we've had with it today. Yeah. They hate us. Because yeah. <laughs> they're irrelevant. Yeah. Into the work so much, how that and your performances, how they kind of work with the collage based practice and idea. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but sort of so you know, how do you feel in terms of like you making art now, like using your own? I mean, I so you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm my own medium, my body's a medium, and I mean, and there are you know, generations of women that came before me, like Colette, that always have used their bodies in similar fashions and um, you know I so I guess that's you know, there's been a shift in that because when we were doing Kuhn transmissions we did lots of the, the, the more the later actions all naked um, and Cozy got a lot of flack for being naked and for working in porno magazines and porno films in order to archive it and show how shallow it was. Now she's being invited to be on panels about the history of feminism and there's been a big shift. There's Sasha Gray, for example, who's openly said Cozy inspired her to make art. It's about time people stop being so hung up on the gender part of the issue We've always felt that it was very difficult for us to get that across. People say, oh, so it's about gender. And we'd say, no, it's about identity. It's about taking control of the narrative of your own life, regardless of anybody else's opinion, and being courageous enough to just do it. Fuck them all, she used to say. <laughs> and we liked it so much we made embroidered patches of it. <laughs> In fact, that was the last thing she said to me before she dropped her body. She said, this year's slogan should be just, fuck them all. <laughs> Might be a good Note. <laughs> ending point.